Tonight we're doing something a bit different. So in lieu of a singular talking head, Marty and I will begin a dialogue that will hopefully generate comments and participation from you all. So please feel free throughout our lively conversation to jump in with questions or comments. Without giving too much away about him, let me just say he's been making photographs since the 1970s throughout North America and Asia. Soon he'll be off to Panama. Much of his work, as with many really good photographs, lend themselves to text. And among the best examples of this in our recent past is his collaboration with writer Annie Prue for Red Desert, History of a Place. And I encourage you all to seek out this book if you're not already aware of it, as it's a very, has a very interesting series of essays combined with Marty's provocative and often sublime photographs. Marty's work resides in scores of public and private collections all over, including the Canadian Center of Architecture in Montreal, the Polaroid Collection in Cambridge, the Library of Congress, National Archives, and the National Museum of American Art, all in Washington, D.C., the High Museum in Atlanta, Georgia, and the Center for Creative Photography in Tucson, to name just a few. So let's get started. And after we finish, there'll be an opportunity um, for a book signing for any number of books. Um, we have two different ones here. One that is available for people to buy, um, the museum is selling. The other one, Marty, can take care of on his own. And we hope that you'll come up and take advantage of this. I asked him to put together some examples of his work, which you'll see sort of scrolling through as sort of his greatest hits as we sort of have our conversation. So let's begin. And I, had, um, I think one thing I wanted to talk about is what it means to be a photographer in our time. Um, and part of what I'm interested in your work, Marty, is um, the discipline it takes to work on something over a long period of time. And the, the, how you develop a relationship with a site, with landscape that evolves, the more you revisit the subject. Well, first of all, I think the notion of discipline and associated with me in any way is um, very hard for me to imagine. I, I, I work pretty much constantly, but it's, it requires, happily, uh, very little discipline. It's driven primarily by curiosity. I, I, I love, as W.C. Fields used to say, I love work, I could watch it all day. <laughs> but um, primarily for me, if I'm not photographing or about to, uh, I'm not a happy person. I'm just... Mm -hmm. I'm just mm -hmm. Has it always been that way for you? Well, since... since uh, I started photographing and studying photography in 1970, but before that, for years, I was a, a, an art student. And um, happily, I discovered early on that sketching canvases and uh, all the related work uh, connected with making uh, conventional painting and sculpture was, was more work than I was willing to put into anything. But I loved the idea of traveling. I loved the idea of sneaking around and being able to go places that were off limits to most other people. And I discovered early on that the camera is rather like a passport. Um, if you wear it brazenly, uh, you automatically are given a kind of respect, which few photographers, of course, few of us really deserve, but we get it anyway. The waters part, we are allowed into places that uh, if you were a poet or a sculptor or a journalist, you would be uh, probably less likely to have access to. So I, I, it's a privileged position to be mm -hmm. a photographer. Um, it's an accidental one to be considered an artist because although I spent all of my after seventh grade, I spent all of my student years in art schools. Mm -hmm. um, I never really quite understood why I was there until photography happened in, in, my, in my curriculum, which was an accident also. Uh, exploring the world is something that uh, I think we all do in our own, mm -hmm. everyone does, uh, if you have any curiosity about anything. But uh, the camera for me, or the notion of being allowed deep into the world that I was interested in uh, seemed uncommonly generous of the universe mm -hmm. and still does. I mean, mm -hmm. after 40 years, I still, I can't wait until Friday when I get to stand in the Panama Canal mm -hmm. again mm -hmm. uh, or up against it, uh, depending on how security views my presence there. 
Uh, and that's not looking good, by the way, but we'll see. I mean, the, the challenge is, is part of the fun also, getting into places that, especially in a post-9-11 world, are considered uh, off limits. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Even to... So you've been there Even before. to photography. You know? So, uh, yeah. You've been there before. I, I, I spent... How long ago? In 1981, I uh, read a book, uh, The History of the Building of the Panama Canal, uh, the Path Between the Seas by David McCullough, famous to many of us for the This American something something on PBS, right? It's still, I think it's still 20 or 30 years into being on PBS, uh, American Masterworks or something like that. It's about American engineer, ingenuity, <coughs> um, creativity, uh, success at endeavors like building the canal or writing great plays or um, Anyway, so I went there in 1981 after reading that book and took the book back to the library, went next door to the bank, closed my checking account, took that money next door to Thomas Cook Travel Agency and mm -hmm. bought a ticket to Panama, and then went to the airport uh, in Atlanta and uh, found myself in a country whose language I didn't understand, mm -hmm. uh, but I knew the canal was there, so I, I walked toward it. You know, talk about naive and energetic. Uh, I just I, I sniffed it out and mm -hmm, found it mm -hmm. and got myself onto a uh, petroleum tanker and was able to sail through the canal from one end to the other. And when it was time to get off the boat, because the transit is only eight hours long, but by then I, I wanted to be a sailor <laughs> slash photographer, um, I asked the captain. Uh, if I could stay on board while he went off to Costa Rica to pick up some petroleum that was coming around from Alaska. And he said he couldn't allow me to stay on board because of international law. Uh -huh. uh, only crew, crew members could stay on board. In international so you asked for a job? No, I didn't ask for a job. I said, you know, just, I, I, I used to be able to do really big, sad brown eyes. Um, and so he said, wait, I have an idea. Uh, What's your mother's name, maiden name? And I told him, he said, do you swear under, by God, mm -hmm. to God that that's yeah. true? I said, yes. He said, you are now the ship's photographer. <laughs> and you may, <laughs> so we spent a week on the Pacific and in port in, uh, in Central America and coming back. And I, I decided, man, try doing that without a camera around your neck. Uh, it just wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. And I knew then, that was, the, that was Ten years into my making pictures, mm -hmm. but I knew then that there was no way I could be as happy uh, doing mm -hmm. any, anything else. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a great segue into the next question because so you you did that all those years ago. You did it with an analog camera. So yeah. now you're going next this Friday, yeah. you're going Friday, and so you know how has your work changed as you went from analog to digital? Because it's it's become harder, um, and those of you who make pictures and used to make pictures in a dark room, make prints or develop film, might relate to this. The, the fact that now uh, it is possible to uh, make technically competent photographs uh, at the rate, according to, depending on which camera you have, at the rate of 25 per second uh, or, or, or you know, uh, makes it really hard to discern when you're doing good work. Mm -hmm. For me, at least. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, can, I have 70 or 80,000 images that are sitting on my computers mm -hmm. and my hard drives, uh, whose value probably uh, equals about nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, but as in any working photographer's life, every year I probably make 10 or 15 that are worth considering. And uh, five or six of those any given year might end up in a good pile. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. digital doesn't mean anything except it, it's it's easy for us to think that we are doing good work simply because we can do top technical Yeah, why is that? Work. Why does it? Why does suddenly everyone's a photographer now? Because digital makes it so easy and, and well, it's, Photoshop it's, and. Well, it, I, I can't answer that. I think it, 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 the an, the analogous uh, explanation to me is that with the proliferation of education and typewriters and laptop computers and, and keyboards. 
everyone can write now whenever they want, oh, and, and iPhones. Right. You know, anyone can write anything they want, whenever they want, and everybody on the planet, and probably on other ones, can, can read it. But th that hasn't given us an uptick in good literature, or good poetry. <laughs> and it hasn't made us, like, more articulate. Uh, it hasn't, right. it doesn't matter that it's easier, it just means that the space, the number of pictures or the number of of blogs or the number of anything uh, is greater between the really important stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's okay too. It's a tool. It's, it's, a a tool. it's simply a tool. Yeah. It's like every house isn't the work of an, of an inspired architect, but most people who are lucky have a house. Mm -hmm. um, most of us who have an iPhone feel, as we should, really lucky to be able to express or uh, capture a moment from time to time. Mm -hmm. or 60 times a day, mm -hmm. uh, and let everybody in the world know what we care about. Mm -hmm. I barely care about what I care about. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't really understand how <coughs> people do it, how they... Digital Balance. simply makes things uh, seem easier. Seem easier. And the hardest part is realizing that it, it gets harder mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. to discern when you yeah. read the And I think the same applies for, I don't know, for realizing this image that you take versus, you know, being in a dark room versus sitting in front of a computer using Photoshop. I have a, a colleague, a, a good friend, in fact, in, in uh, New York, in Brooklyn, who uh, began making large format photographs just as most people were starting to dis dismantle their dark rooms. Um, large 8 by 10 color mm. stuff, which, he, mm. which is uh, some of the best work that I know of being made right now. Um, and he, even he grumbles, but he's, he's, he's 40. He grumbles like an 80 year old about people not understanding the ritual and the magnificent beauty of the, of the struggle to set up the camera, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. make the back parallel to the front or however you mm -hmm. want right. to do that. He thinks that digital uh, technology makes it easier to take, take for granted the sacrament of mm -hmm. making a picture. Right. And I, and based on how much I sweat and struggle and how much my teeth clench and, and grind, right. when I'm standing behind the digital camera making a picture, I say he's, he's maybe right for him, but it's, it just certainly doesn't describe my mm -hmm. attitude. I take it just as seriously. In fact, knowing that it's so easy to make. Yeah, but that's because you started analog. It's, it's possible. I don't, I don't think so, though. I don't think that a, a poet who will be writing sublime work in 25, who isn't born yet, uh, will be making necessarily, uh, will, will be taking her work seriously simply mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. she grew up in a time when it was about sharpening pencils and, mm -hmm, and replacing mm -hmm. typewriter tape. I think you take your craft seriously. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, if you have excellent work to compare it to, mm -hmm. And that can be a segue if you want. But if you have excellent work to <laughs> if you have excellent work to compare it to, you're not going to do bad work. Mm -hmm. Right. You may do work that's redundant in the huge picture, but it will not be meaningless work. Mm -hmm. uh, it will not be uh, useless. It will contribute somehow to the literature of the film, like photography, uh, music, dance, uh, mm -hmm. cinematography. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's it's all when. When what you do, when what, when what I do with most of my life ceases to become difficult, I certainly hope to stop doing it because then it's not going to be fun. Either. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's for me just as hard to remember where I put a series of digital files and just to remember right. you know, mm -hmm. what I have for breakfast. Mm -hmm. So, using that segue, I mean, I I see the kind of work that you do in, in certain landscape. <coughs> Architectural photographers. I always, I always, because I'm a historian. I always sort of see that in the tradition of certain 19th-century mm -hmm. photographers who you know, return to the same place. They sort of refine their vision, develop their vision over a long period of time. Who, um, who would you say are people that have influenced you, both past and present? If there's anyone, you know, you can name names. The first, well, the first one I can't because he, he or he or she, probably he uh, is anonymous. Uh, when I was about 11 years old, I used to sneak downtown on, on the trolley in, in Milwaukee and sneak off to the magnificent Beaux-Arts Public Library. It, it 
this this palace of not wisdom but sort of stench you know sort of the stench of a not Victorian bathrooms and, and huge marble halls filled with mildewed books and creepy people lurking in stacks. You know, it's a library. And so, um, I, but I used to go there partly because it was wonderfully <coughs> creepy that way, mm -hmm. but also because there were, there were books whose spines I couldn't read because they were in like French mm -hmm. or Latin. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I grabbed accidentally and 45 minutes later realized I was reading Aristotle's diary. Mm -hmm. um, it was full of drawings and stuff, mm -hmm, and I mm -hmm. was reading it, of course, but it was, it was... Anyway, so in that adventure at the library, I found a book um, in which is a photograph, a back when 20-line screen, in, it was printed in probably 1910 or 15, uh, really, really bad reproduction. The best they could do, though, for the budget... On wood a, pulp, a picture, no less. A, a, on, on wood pulp, probably. On wood pulp, probably, a, 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 you know, paper cardboard back book. Uh, it was a photograph of the Opera House in Paris. And at that instant, I mean, that instant, which lasted a, probably a half hour, I, I, I tried to extrapolate what was between the dots of that reverently made but horribly reproduced mm -hmm. image of this mysterious, beautiful place, not, a, not unlike by lineage, the building mm -hmm. I was in. Mm -hmm. in, in. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, my goodness, this is... If only there were a way to make this a better picture, you know, a way to make this little mystery mm -hmm. clearer to me. And, mm -hmm. you know, jump ahead 10 years, and I'm studying photography with, uh, with Emmett Gowan, who at the time was following an 8x10 view camera around, uh, learning that well, there is a way to do better than 20 on screen. Mm -hmm. You know, and so learning about the richness of the Okay, so the anonymous French photographer, mm -hmm. Emmett Gowan, Etche, probably, mm -hmm. Diane Arbus, and most importantly, finally, when I realized I didn't want to be anyone else, I wanted mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A, a, a photograph made by Robert Frank. Uh, mm -hmm. Which one? Uh, out of the uh, window at the hotel window in Butte, Montana, mm -hmm. in the Americas. Mm -hmm. It's the picture that. Mm -hmm without realizing I was doing the same thing again, there's a name for this disease, but I, I put the book in my backpack, I went to the bank, I took out some more money, I went to the Greyhound station, got on a bus, <laughs> went to Butte, Montana, and spent two months there. Find the window. While I was getting credit, this was graduate school by yeah. now, I was getting credit for not wanting to be in school. I thought, this world, this is a great <laughs> universe to have been born into. It was the 70s too, which explains the other part of that, I guess. But, um, so Butte, Montana was this window into the complexity, you know, so Robert Frank, okay, so you know Robert Frank, I hope. Uh, people resent it when people sometimes say, those are the most important pictures ever made. But I think each of us can have our own secret little pile of the most important. And to me, uh, a dozen of those pictures uh, didn't change my trajectory because getting up in the morning does that, but it gave me one. It gave me a, uh, a baseline against which to uh, develop an appetite. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's an eclectic group, Ache Arbus. Uh, um, well, so is, so is any dinner table any of us ever sits around. Right. I mean, if we're lucky, we make interesting mm -hmm. mixes of the mess of friends we choose mm -hmm. to, or are lucky enough to have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if they were all the same, It'd be like being at a tea party, mm -hmm. um, but versus happily, a dinner party. They're, happily, they're not. They're, 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 so that's it. I mean, the mix is, is pretty severe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And lately, uh, Ed, Ed Bertinsky, uh, uh, some of you probably know his work. Um, he's a he's called an environmental photographer. Um, any adjective. That, that I see in front of the word photographer as makes me kind of um, antsy about why we don't teach English and philosophy more than we do. But uh, he's okay, a photographer so who yeah. makes, makes pictures in the world, so he's an environmental photographer. Um, and his work is important to me because he, he tackles head on the political uh, issues of landscape in a, in a modern and, quite frankly, um, um, 
horrifying mm -hmm. world, according to, according to that subtext. Um, his craft is admirable. Do they have to be so big, though? I mean, let's well, talk about size. Stand farther back. You know, just, just step back. I mean, if they're too big, just back off. Mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, I think they're, they're too big for me, but so then I just go mm -hmm. to my computer and look at them at a sense of the size. <laughs> you know, side, people are impressed. Uh, this is not news to most of you. People are impressed by big prints now because, well, I can't even finish that sentence. But well, since the 80s, they've just gotten bigger and bigger and yeah, bigger and bigger and bigger. bigger, and bigger. bigger. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's why we can stay. Are they better, bigger? What is? Um, well, with few exceptions, you know, no, they're not. Okay, yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's my point, they're not. But, yeah. but that's, but, okay, so. That's, that's, Size that's, matters in the, in, in the market. Some of you might know a photographer in Boston, uh, just a brilliant, and speaking of, steadfast determination to continue on long-term projects. A gentleman named Jim Dow, who I've known for 40 years now, he makes 8 by 10 color view camera pictures. And about 20 years ago, at the beginning of this, ability to make inexpensive, monstrous prints, uh, one of his dealers, uh, representing a donor to what would be a museum show, said, Jim, we really love this. Eight by ten jewels, beautiful, magnificent prints. Um, Jim, you know, your work is really good, but can you can you make them bigger? <laughs> and at the time, he had two little babies. You know, he had to raise through, you know, at least to get them out of the house at eighteen or something. So he had to consider the financial repercussions of, of the proposal that he make bigger pictures. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, and and I wasn't privy to his decision making, but he ended up making bigger pictures. Bigger pictures. Now, they were, I don't think they were bigger than by 11 by 14, but they were huge to those of us who grew up thinking yeah. the 4 by 5 contact print was substantial. It was not only substantial, but rich enough to spend a day on mm -hmm. making, and then a lifetime enjoying. Mm -hmm. uh, now, of course, uh, four by, people say, hey, I just made a 4 by 6 print. And I, you have to say inches or feet, or feet right. and and the answer is always going to be along with a puffy chest, feet. Yeah. Of course. Right. So go figure. You know, it's yeah. of course I have an eight foot long print in the gallery, but right. I'm right. bragging about it. It had to be eight foot long because it's only ten inches high. Right. This is true. So yeah. um, anyway, so yeah, size of course is is uh, fashionable now, and it certainly doesn't. It's like. Okay, so if you get a poet to sit down and do a reading, does the poem become better if it's shouted? <laughs> I think possibly not. Yeah. So, um, I think bigger isn't necessarily better, but it certainly drives a lot of the market business well, for, for high-end photographers who are... Yeah, and that's, that's perfectly okay. I yeah. mean, if that's what it takes in, in a world where everyone's screaming, screaming for their 15 minutes, mm -hmm. fine. Yeah. I mean, I do not begrudge anybody who is getting paid mm -hmm. by the acre for their photographs mm -hmm. and, and making a killing. It's mm -hmm. lovely mm -hmm. um, for them. But as far as being satisfying in ways that matter to, well, to me, mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. um, I'd rather things be stunningly gorgeous than mm -hmm. stunning. You know, yeah, yeah. Shock and awe. Yeah, shock and awe. Or as I, I like to say, awe and shucks. You know, it's awe not, and shucks. It's just not, it's just not, yeah. sorry. Yeah. But that's personal. I mean, we teach people how to make enough money to buy printers that are 66 inches wide now, so mm -hmm. they can make 66 by 100 inch prints mm -hmm. yeah. in the privacy of their own homes. Right. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. So do you see your um, pictures as sort of experiential, do you sort of wanting the viewer to, you know, be standing in the spot that you were when you made the exposure? Do you, you know, what is it you really want people to take away from your pictures? I want, I want, and this is, this hasn't changed ever since I started making uh, photographs that I thought were good. I want, I want, I want, if I can be there when the person is looking at the picture, of course, if you make books, uh, and have exhibitions far flung, you can't be there always, but 
the most satisfying experience for me as the maker of the picture is to stand sort of anonymously near where someone uh, skips a breath or mm -hmm. does one of those involuntary I can't believe mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. I, you know it's it's uh, sometimes it's oh where is this but sometimes it translates into mm -hmm. how could this place be possible mm -hmm. and that's uh, that is, I think, what 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 I am attracted to has in common. Mm -hmm. uh, every you know, every moment, of course, is some kind of miracle. But to be uh, drawn to things that are implausibly audacious or spectacularly engineered mm -hmm. or uh, improbably beautiful, mm -hmm. for reasons that you know, I spent a couple of years working in Pennsylvania photographing steel mills as before they were demolished immediately before. And uh, and some of the most satisfying kind of moments of aesthetic bliss uh, were in those scary, dark, uh, abandoned uh, monuments to a, a culture. Mm -hmm. you know, the 19th century, the, the, f the first American century, the end of the 19th century, the industrial kind of uh, bravado that we plowed through our, our life, and you get to see I mean, some of these things are here. Um, they're they're implausibly beautiful, and, mm -hmm. and and because they have such a deep story, mm -hmm. because they're part of a narrative, which isn't about photography. I think there's there's some there's a lot of value in understanding the history of photography, and more value in understanding why what you love. We love in, in art or anywhere else in life, but finding a, a kind of to say niche makes it sound like it's a market niche, but it's it's really uh, an affinity for a, for your for my affections. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I couldn't explain obviously in, in a very brief amount of time why I love these places, mm -hmm. but they all to me are part of a deep story, a deep narrative about culture. And to me, they are uh, our autobiography. This is what we chose to do with our time in the 19th century, culturally, collectively. Uh, I have a, yeah, sometimes we shouldn't name our colleagues and friends. I have a, a former colleague, probably soon to be former friend, who, who chided me years ago for loving, uh, for photographing the, the, the open pit copper mines and making them look so beautiful. Mm. People will misunderstand, they'll think you love these places she said. And I realized then that that was the end of our real friendship because she didn't know that I truly did love them <laughs> and still do. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's complicated, mm -hmm. but I'm drawn to places that seem to be about a deeper narrative than just what I feel like. I frankly sometimes don't even care what I feel like. I certainly don't mm -hmm. expect anybody else to care what I feel what I feel as an artist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I want them to, and that's you guys, I want you to understand uh, what a magnificent moment occurred when the light on that place was doing that, and then the good luck uh, when it happens, and it's not often, uh, that I was there for that. And so I could come away with that to show Mm -hmm. you something you probably wouldn't mm -hmm. otherwise be able to imagine, much less see. Right? So it's it's what I would do if I were a poet, except mm -hmm. I have to haul stuff around mm -hmm. in suitcases to do this. But right. it's the same kind of um, to, to understand layers of the world that aren't necessarily available. Mm -hmm. uh, or the things that are more available to you through you know, working digitally versus um, analog? No, no. no. no the, the, the Bellows camera, when I used to haul it around, and I still do, uh, it's, it's like uh, guys walking dogs if they're looking to pick up, straight guys, if they're looking to pick up girls. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you get a good looking dog and you put, you know, a Bellows, a view camera yeah, on a tripod chick magnet. Uh, is a chick magnet. And so I, I, I get, when I'm working, it, in Washington, for example, on the mall with the view camera, um, people 
you know, make my day t twice as inefficient by stopping to want to chat okay. about right. Right. Um Nobody cares if I have a, a Sony digital camera, yeah. but they want to know, especially if the bellows is all the way out. Yeah. You know. It's an old thing to get. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the old, old time. So it's, 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 it's predictable and it's also lovely. I mean, the fact that there's still curiosity about anything when everything is available on your iPod or your iPad. Um, to find things in the real world that are still a bit odd or strange or, or, or curious. And curiosity is uh, what drives it all, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then you, know, you do, you, work, you have many projects that you've started in the 70s that are ongoing. And <laughs> yeah, because I'm, I'm still not well, dead. I know. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, so what, I mean, what draws you initially to a topic that, I mean, you know, you've got this long-term thing going on in El Paso now, and, um, you know, how do you, not well, how do you pick it, but, you know, what really they, draws yeah, you to these in the first place? I could say sort of that they pick me. I, I had the, you know, really good luck for a decade of working with the writer Annie Crew on this, on this book. Uh, the, the woman is 15 years older than I am. I will never be able to work as hard as she does um, at researching and learning about what it is uh, what it is I'm interested in. She uh, raising the bar is a, a, a goofy way of saying it, but I, I'm constantly reminded of what hard work looks like and what the result of hard work looks like. And so, what she taught me when we were working on this project is that. One of the values that she saw in my, my work, uh, my photography, was that it was about the mundane. It was about the routine of, mm -hmm. of the sort of daily uh, existence, in, in, in this case, in the Red Desert or mm -hmm. in El Paso uh, at, the, at the smelter. She, and she, she introduced me to the idea of deep history, which is a uh, mid-20th century kind of convention and how to think about understanding culture is if you want to, if you want to understand any century or any epic, understand what, not what Napoleon had for breakfast, but what the person who darned his socks had for breakfast. Uh, what the, you know, what the common dining room table had on it. Uh, what people's clothing was made out of, how they made their money, where they, what they read, what they did if they couldn't read, um, understanding the, the intricacies of, of, of anybody's day in any period you choose will give you a far broad, so translate that into, if I want to understand the 20th century, the first half of which I was born in, um, I need to understand all of these things, mm -hmm. or at least know, know what they look like. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't expect to die really smart, but I, I do want to have a whole mess of images running through my head, mm -hmm. assuming I get the, the time, mm -hmm. um, of, of amazing places, mm -hmm. or places that were amazing to me simply because the layer of um, uh, meaning on top of meaning, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. so that my world was not someplace I left not having known. Mm -hmm. I want to, I want to know where I was. Mm -hmm. Any plans for Panama? Uh, to be picked up at the airport by a guy who's in, who has no English and uh, come back a week later a bit more fluent in Spanish. Mm -hmm. That's a, along with wanting to make at least a couple of good pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, the canal, most of you probably know, is 100 years old next year. Uh, <clears throat> uh, in 2015, a third well, for the past five years, they've been building a new canal next to the old one because the ships have gotten bigger, the efficiencies of mostly Trans-Pacific uh, uh, transit and, and uh, petroleum shipping have become, have put demands on the canal, which uh, a bigger canal, 60% more capacity per lot. Uh, and we can talk about this later afterwards if you want, but the 19th century design for the 20th century canal is now obsolete, largely. So the new canal is going to be... So I, I used to look at pictures that were made in 1915 of Teddy Roosevelt and the steam shovel 
um, you know, doing the, you know, Michael Dukakis on the battleship bridge. And that kind of presidential moment in these pictures were mostly taken by people with large format view cameras. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I just wish my parents had met 80 years earlier, because of course, I don't know where we are now, but I wanted to be those photographers. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I thought, oh, my goodness, they're doing it again. <laughs> Yeah. You know, 90 feet away, I can go, I, you know, I know yeah. the place, I can go there, I can do that. Mm -hmm. So my plans are to meet a, a pilot, uh, wow. convince him or her that trading photography for air to, you know, time in the air will be advantageous to him. Mm -hmm. uh, get a couple of good days in at the, at the site, and then come home and plan the next trip. Mm -hmm. With a semester at the Instituto Cervantes thrown in so that it'll be easier next time. But this is all... Just part of this clawing away of just being more and more curious about mm -hmm. big, wonderful things. Mm -hmm. um, Linda Connor, a photographer who many of you know, uh, a dear friend, with whom I we, uh, with whom I argue every time we talk about pictures, uh, looked at because. some of this work recently and yeah. said, <coughs> with a straight face uh, and lovingly, she said. Why do these pictures look like they're made by a guy? <laughs> I just, I just, I, I said, you know, they're, sure. <laughs> you know, um, they're, they're, they're about, you know, she's, her um, love of detail is, is something that many people relate or identify mm -hmm. with as a, a, a female's way of making pictures. Oh, yes. And I don't, yes. I don't, I'm, I'm not yeah. smart, I can't navigate all that. I just make yeah. pictures of things that interest me. And if they look like they were made by a guy, well, cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That would be me. Oh, my God. So it's a, um, I'm drawn to the big, audacious, uh, complicated stories. Uh, and so there's no... So it's no, about size? There's no, well, no, it's about duration. It's uh -huh. not about size. It's about, it's about, it's about import. Mm -hmm. And, you know, language is cool stuff. You think about what is important. It's something is what is, what brings into the, into play uh, substantive things. So what is important? What, what, what carries with it? Mm -hmm. Meaning. Mm -hmm. And uh, the smelter in El Paso because mm -hmm. of its location mm -hmm. because of this history mm -hmm. uh, imports mm -hmm. value as mm -hmm. as subject mm -hmm. for for people who write history for people who make photographs for people who do videos so you do you do really research your your, your site your location your your context you not at first at, at no. first it's really about uh, uh, seduction I mean I'm, I'm, uh, if I hear that something is going to be blown up by the Taliban in, in Kurdistan or, or Afghanistan, I think, well, uh, will I be allowed to go there? Will the people I love let me go there? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the things usually blow up before I get there, so uh -huh. the question is moot. But I'm drawn to things that are, I guess because of the, his, the, the importance of the narrative of history, which, you know, it just means the story. Um, uh, Stories matter. I mean, it's really all that matters. I mean, the mythology of, yeah. of, of cultures sustains them, mm -hmm. and it, unhappily often, but uh, but it's what we run on. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm just I'm not an avid or I'm not a disciplined reader, but I I know how to find material about the places I'm, I end up being drawn to to, to mm -hmm. enhance the probability that I won't stumble into that landscape mm -hmm. completely stupid because mm -hmm. uh, that's dangerous mm -hmm. and, and it's insulting to anybody who's mm -hmm. already there. You worked in the Red Desert a long time, right? Seven years, there, seven or eight years, yeah, yeah. How did you how did you sort of determine it was you were finished? Uh, they published the book and uh, and I left Wyoming. Mm -hmm. you know, ended up in Albuquerque right after that project. Uh, and, and by that time, the, the desert had become so depressing. It was the, it was the middle 2000s, 2005, 6, 7, 8. And the entire place is public land and yalls. And uh, Halliburton had kind of uh, taken the initiative prompted by 
events inside the Beltway uh, in the Vice President's office to kind of commandeer the Red Desert and turn it into a, a industrial wasteland. Mm -hmm. And that's not even political talk, that's just fact. I mean, the politics of it are, are horrifying, but, um, but it's energy, energy uh, but here's the thing, it's energy extraction. It's what we all agree to. So it's not a, a political diatribe against. Oh, it can be. That's fine. It can be, but I, but I don't. I, but I don't. I don't. I don't feel the. I don't have the right to. Mm -hmm. My good friends, the environmental photographers, uh, can uh, can blow a vein in their. You know, they they they, they often become angry about uh, what's happening in their part of New Mexico or Wyoming because of this or that. Mm -hmm. um, at the, and then they'll go home and turn on the microwave or drive home in their car, you know, f filled with gasoline and yeah. diesel. You know, so I, sorry, there are ways of being more gentle on the planet, but mm -hmm. um, complaining about it is not one of them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, yeah, I don't. This is it. Should we open up the floor to <coughs> the folks? I'm happy to entertain questions. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> About my what in it? My, my interest <laughs> yeah. in it? Yes, your interest in it. Uh, why are you photographing? Why are you drawn to those? I'm not sure that that is a, a conscious, uh, I'm not sure that characteristic is a conscious uh, part of why I'm drawn to them. Uh, um, I th gosh, I think, okay, so it's, if I'm going to do something that's, I mean, the ego drives this, I guess. I want to do something that's going to be important later, after I'm dead. Um, one way to guarantee that is to photograph stuff that's being torn down while I'm photographing it. I mean, that guarantees that if it's important and it's gone next week, I'm, I already then have the only pictures of it during its last. Um, so that's part of it. Uh, I think the other thing is that the patina, you know, the notion of of things having a, a kind of dignity with age. Um, centuries is good, decades is, is okay. Um, and in the case of the new Panama Canal, the concrete not yet being cured is okay too. But it's part of, if it's part of a bigger story. One of the things that interests me, and this, I, I hope this ties into this, is I've become interest, uh, curious about um, why about where wealth comes from in cultures. And it all comes from, it all, it, much of it comes from places where the people are terribly poor and remain terribly poor. So, hmm, okay. Gold bananas from a place where bananas grow. Why aren't the people who pick the bananas, you know, why don't they have higher literacy rates, um, why aren't they healthier, why aren't they more, so copper mines, gold mines, uh, the politics of a canal through a poor country in, in, in Central America, um, most of those things that have those kinds of stories have had them for such a long time that by virtue of that, they're old. I mean, I'm not as inclined to go see a world premiere of anything as I am to see something that has percolated into my consciousness as being important. So, uh, I mean, I stood at the wall on the street watching them dig the holes in this early 70s for what became the World Trade Center, and I thought, eh, not very interesting, too big, um, but certainly not very interesting. You know, well, you know, they were very important and, and became iconic. Um, so it's it's a call based on a, a pull based on wanting to be drawn into a story. But if there's not a story yet, I'm I'm likely to be the wrong guy to be there. Does that touch it? Well, I mean, I had you know, a follow up, and I get the premise. Social virtue of the writing. So, why not just photograph my farm workers in California for making their argument about us? 
<clears throat> because I don't. So why do you choose abandoned steel shop? Mm, migrant farm worker photographs are being made by many, many people who think that they uh, belong there doing that more than I do. Um, there's probably not an irrelevant photograph made by one of those people, but I'm not one of those people to make that picture. I don't trust portraits at all. Uh, oh. Look, I'm going to hell anyway. <laughs> oh, um, I, that's a if Jesus. you want to understand a person, the last thing you're going to do is look at a picture made with a by a, by a camera and a photographer standing, sitting, standing 15 or 20 or 5 feet away from them, uh, making a picture. That, that picture is not going to tell me anything that I would trust, period. I trust, I, trust, I trust what we do. I mean, we spend our time doing stuff. Um, so I trust this to be more biographical <laughs> than a photograph of a person's face. I hope I've offended someone. <laughs> yes. Uh, so Marty, so do you feel that your printed uh, images convey what you are, what you are seeing, what you're experiencing? Um, Having just said that about portraits? No, 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 I, no, I don't think they convey what, no, they convey, photographs are like, the, I think, to, to me, they're much like a written page. Uh, they convey st uh, structurally what I kind of want you to sort of experience. <laughs> it's like going to a, uh, uh, I didn't used to like Mahler, for example. I thought Mahler was a depressive and egoist. But I heard a performance of something I've heard many times before, just a few months ago here, uh, of, a, of a Mahler. Do you, do you remember what it was, the first? Magnificent. I mean, but only because that that particular conductor <coughs> and that orchestra on that evening made it perfect, perfectly resonant by accident with me. Um, my pictures are simply, uh, not simply. Well, simple's good. Uh, yeah, they're simply uh, renderings of 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 the suggestion of what I stood in front of. Now they're they're heavily loaded with <coughs> suggestions about how you feel. Like, I would not want you to see that and think of a Cezanne still life of peaches and, and bananas. I would like you to feel something about that. But what you feel is, or, or imagine, or learn, is going to be based on what you bring to it. And uh, that might be, I have a neighbor in Wyoming who saw these pictures and said, you ought to get a job at the Portland Cement Lobby in Washington. <laughs> well, that was one take on what I do. Um, he still he remained my drinking buddy, mm -hmm. but I, I wouldn't go to him for a, a review of my work for the for my next book. Um, yeah, Do, I'm sorry. Does that answer it? Yes. Sort of. Uh, you mentioned that Diane Arbus was one of your like influential photographers, mm -hmm. but you don't. That's right. She does Good a lot toy. Of like, like the the boy standing there. That's the one that like really With the grenades. Me. What? With the grenades. Yeah. 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 See, like, I know no, what I know I what you're talking about. Portrait. I don't get why. No, I just I didn't say I, they, they don't have value. I said I don't trust them. Okay. You know, they're they're, they're magnificently rich. Deep, I mean, many of my friends, some of my best friends, take pictures of people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like them any less. I just don't trust that that they portray they, um, I, anything that I'd want to bank on. Um, I mean. Oh, we're going to have to talk about this. Yeah, we don't have to. Yeah, this is so. So this is another, this is the first half, half of, of the gallery lecture series that will continue some other day. <laughs> no, but Diane she's right. Dying artist pictures are sublimely, every <coughs> one of them that I've ever seen. You know, yes, they are. Um, and. She did it, uh, she did that, uh, as well as it can be done, I think. I mean, there's, we can argue about this, but that would be a waste of your time and mine. She did that as well as it can be done. That set of eyes, those, those people, that set of motivations, that depressive mentality, you know, the, the, the complicated chemistry that made, made her magical, um, makes those pictures magical. They are not portraits of those people. They are a conversation between that moment, that photographer, 
uh, that person, uh, whether they felt well that day, whether they felt particularly like a Jewish giant or just a giant. I mean, you know, you, you, you layer, when you're an artist, you get to layer things on top of things. Um, and you end up with a story. That's a story. It's not the person. Yeah. Would, would, be this, would you feel the same about a portrait of someone who didn't know their picture was being taken? Certainly. Okay. I mean, uh, but that's that's a flip answer, and I don't mean to sound flip. Uh, with certainty, I would, because of the pictures, say, of, of Harry Callahan's magnificent Chicago street stuff, or even in Providence later. Um, these are pulled from, or anybody else who does street photography, these are pulled from hundreds usually of, of images that uh, drop away and end up uh, on, the, on the editing room floor, editing room from the floor for the one where something about that woman, you know, might have something to do with what Eleanor looked like when she was 32 or what Barbara might look like when she's 70. You know, they're, they're, they're the artist's imaginings. Uh, and the scowl on the face with the cigarette might not be that that person is an unhappy person who's destined for throat cancer. It, the scowl might be because she's also stepping in dog shit while she's <laughs> puffing on her camel. Um, so it's not, it's not conclusive. It's not anything but terribly interesting. Terribly, as you mentioned, it, it's a it's a window into a, a full range of other things. It's not a biography. It's a it's a it's fiction. Does that make sense? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Edward. I don't think there's, well, in, in, in the lexicon of religions, mine, I believe in plate tectonics. That's, that's what wins ultimately. And so, you know, truly, I mean this. I mean, it all, it all ends up transformed completely. And it's happening now. Um, what I love about these things, for do you know the Doxiatis, the Greek urban planner? 40s, 50s, and 60s, wrote a book one time, on his cover was a photograph, I thought it was a book of biology, because there was a petri dish on, on the cover. What it was, was a high altitude photograph of Athens. You're getting my drift, right? Um, scouring the landscape, um, it's what slugs do when they walk across my yard at night. Um, it's what of bicycles do when they go through the wilderness area on their bicycles. It's what road builders do when they make 17 lanes plowing through an urban area for more traffic. I mean, it's all a version of, of what this particular kind of vertebrate does, this mammal, because we can. Um, I think it's, it's, not been, it's, it's, it's not benign for sure, um, but it is, it's an important part of what we do by choice. So I love the complex argument about, okay, for example, if, if one of these copper mines in, say, 8,000 years uh, still read as, as a pit, a terrace pit a mile deep, uh, it would be, a, if there were tourists then, a place where tourists would come and admire the magnificent work of this you know, culture that, that produced it, the same way we do now in Egypt or um, in northern Kurdistan, central Kurdistan, where some of the oldest buildings in the world exist intact. Um, 
It's what we do. I don't think we don't do anything that doesn't you know, impact something. Uh, but these are because these kinds of pictures prompt that kind of question. Uh, I think they're. Um, not I think I know that they are more satisfying to me. That they were simply pictures, of, you know, pictures of beautiful architecture in, in fill in the blank. Uh, Anchor Wat, you know, amazing ancient structures. Uh, many, many, many people make beautiful photographs of those things. Uh, I don't, I don't need to. Therefore, you know, I, I need to do uh, what I'm doing. Not because a lot of other people aren't also doing it, but because these things resonate with me in the in the really big picture. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, actually, this just really expounds on what the gentleman has said. Mm -hmm. uh, my impression, especially when you mentioned you know, the masking, you said people look at my work and they think, you know, that here is masculinity to it, or this was the inspiration, whatever. Uh, it, to me, it, it's also very much a man's, and I'll say man's is a human kind, mm -hmm. man's control over nature. That's what I see in these pictures. Uh -huh. And um, to some extent, there's beauty at the same time. In terms of beauty is not interested. I think of the hydroelectric dams and the water coming mm -hmm. over them. Mm -hmm. But by the same token, it's still basically changing the face of nature. And again, to me, that's a very masculine thing and something that is very much part of the Industrial Revolution. I, I um, yes to everything you said. I mean, it, there is there is a um, ex except for the idea of controlling nature, uh, it can't be done. Number one. Uh, but it's attempted. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But so is uh, yeah. But so is when a flying squirrel jumps out of a tree for the first time. You know, it's 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 less dangerous for the planet when that happens than when we build a dam across the Columbia. But the no I didn't understand my work very well. Pardon me? Or a lead smelter in El Paso. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's what, when, when the questions start coming like, what's that doing there? How did that get there? If you, if you say that the legacy for six generations of people was uh, ill health, mm -hmm. contaminated aquifer, uh, bad lungs, short lifespans. Uh, those are questions which wouldn't come to an audience viewing photographs unless the photographs are of that place. That's what I think I'm doing. I think I'm, I'm making pl places seductive, seeming enough photographically to, to demand questions. How dare you call this beautiful? I, you know, that's the, the most satisfying question I can ever be asked. Uh, it's it, because, because beauty, as you know, if you've been in the basement of the Prado and seen, you know, beauty ain't just about pretty. It's about magnificently raw renderings of horror. Um, and again, that's transitory as well. Uh, there's no controlling, at least in the romantics notion, which I subscribe to somewhat, there's no controlling uh, people's desires to be uh, happy. So a revolution or, a, or an uprising or a coup depicted in, in lithographs or drawings is happily a temper an, an event whose horror passes. And of course, we can count on other horrors filling in, but uh, what we learn as we go, I think. And these pictures are made during the time that I get to be here. You know, I get to be alive looking at the stuff. And these are the things that, where does wealth come from? At whose expense? And I, I, I that's the best, thank you. <laughs> that's a, an important question.
Yeah. How do you decide on the color of black and white? Um, I don't want to sound snippy, but my, my, my good friends who used to make color photographs back when they had the stability of a fruit compote um, amazed me because they would spend all of their time making money to buy electricity to keep their freezers cold enough to preserve the negatives and prints they were making of this like fruit salad and, and gelatin. Um, I said to myself, and it, I never let them know that I thought it was silly, but I said to myself, I, I, I love color, I can't wait until it makes sense to do it. And now that you can spit pigments made of minerals, make basically what Rembrandt's piece are made of, onto paper that in combination, according to Wilhelm, I love this, you know, the Wilhelm testing, some of this stuff will last for, get this, between 80 and 34,000 years. And I'd say, you know, that's good enough for me. Um, so the, the color is important. I, so I shoot, of course, I shoot everything in color now. And of course, the, 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 the acrobatics that we are allowed by the technology says, well, I can make this black and white anytime I want. But I find now that color is, in fact, uh, part of what I do happily naturally. And, uh, man, <laughs> you know, I still, this is the artist talking. This is, I mean, does it doesn't get better. I don't, you know, impressionist uh, pastel drawing of a, of a terraced antiquity. You know, I don't believe it gets better than that. It's a lot of it's just as good as that, but that's as good as it gets for me. Um, does that answer? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Marty, do you manipulate, manipulate your images? I manipulate nothing. <laughs> it's all the truth. Yeah, 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 I mess around with a bunch of stuff all the time because, uh, you know, about the, well, uh, <coughs> Ansel Adams spent his time manipulating after he was driven back to his darkroom, um, manipulating what he had on that one piece of film so that it would look like what he wanted us to imagine it felt like to, you know, all that. Everyone manipulates. And because I am ethically challenged, I, I mean, it, I, do, I do it a lot. But I do it so that it seems like you should have to ask that question. I hope. I mean, I hope I do. Yes. As far as the preservation or the documentation of a disappearing phenomenon, particularly an industrial site production, mm -hmm. how do you see your work relating to or diverging from the veterans who, of course, did that to such an extent in a very particular way? Yeah, I think that um, they, let's see, I'm not as patient as they are. I, I would be bored after my 15th fill in the blank, water tap, um, only because I'm not, my, my mind isn't the mind of a scientist. I think they are more, as much scientists as, as, as artists. Um, their work is, and good science, of course, is, is the foundation for a lot of good art. I mean, look at the impressionists, you look at uh, John Cage's music. I mean, anything you can think of in science is eventually going to have an analog in art. Um, I, I'm kind of a, uh, I'm voracious, I'm impatient, I'm, I'm curious to the point where there's probably medication I could take to make it less so, but I'm, I'm not steadfastly interested in any one thing long enough to, although it might look like a preoccupation here, none of these things is like anything else preceding it in my experience, so they're all wandering around in this rather narrow range of industrial artifact. But the Beckers, uh, God love them, uh, showed us every iteration in the same kind of light that uh, those things could possibly be viewed in. Not really, but it seems that way to us. And uh, I admire that. When people work that hard at doing work that perfect, I'm off the hook because everyone knows everyone isn't perfect. And so I get to be one of those guys. You know, I just get to do this. Can I ask a follow -up? Yeah. Do you think that your do you consider your work to be romantic? Uh, you know, it depends on 
it's not easy listening. I hope. I mean, it's not it's not Andre Castellanos or, or uh, uh, Barry Manilow. I think it's uh, it's. I, no, um, I don't think the answer to that is yes. <laughs> It, 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 it probably romanticizes or, or, or monumentalizes ordinary stuff. And if, that is, if that's romantic, oh, it, oh yeah, then of course yes, because also romantic is, is highly unrealistic um, in, in its expectations. And I expect everyone will love these as much as I do, and of course no one does, or everyone doesn't, or something, you know how to say that. But uh, yeah, so they're, they're, they make me, they make, when I'm, really on with making pictures. Uh, I am as happy as when in my personal life I'm happy. You know, it's everything. So yeah, yeah, okay. Romantic but not sentimental. And one, yeah, thank just, you. Yes. yeah, one last question. Okay. Yes. Okay, so how do these images not fall into the category of portraits? Because I recently met portraits of um, emotion Portraits of place, portraits of things that are portraying your intimate demise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, well, that, yeah, that. Portraits of nostalgia. Okay, nostalgia, um, mm -hmm, okay. Um, I think you can expand the definition of what you Oh, for sure, I hope so. Oh, Lord, yes. But these, I'm calling them portraits. Um, oh, oh. But, but they have everything. Yeah, you're kind of, you're saying what I mean. Thank you. Um, what I mean by uh, I don't trust a portrait is I don't trust a picture of a face of a person made by somebody sitting or standing in front of them to give me anything useful about them except what some weird little agreement was between the artist and, and his ego or that person and the artist. Or, you know. um, but what I do trust is stuff. I mean, it's forensic. This is if if this is what we did, this must be what we cared about. When I look at a portrait made by, the, I want to say Burt Bacharach, who's the famous Boston portrait photographer, who made John Kennedy seem to us like a noble and good man who thought nothing about the future of his beloved country. Yeah, that wasn't what he was thinking about in Boston. You know, we know what he, he was thinking. Probably one of the things he was thinking. You no, know, wasn't it? So it's not that. It's these are the evidence. These are. A scientist looking at these would say, in a couple of generations, ah, that was there. And that portray is, 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 is what everything does, somehow. These portraits. Because it's exactly true. Yeah. I trust it these more. Yeah. The truth is what is in front of the camera at that time. How we manipulate it or make it theatrical. That was there in front of the camera. Yes. Chose to frame it. Right, you're right, you're, you're right. This that's portrait. That's what makes it romantic because you're at an incredible vantage point that most people aren't, so they can't see the mystery and the grandeur and the monumentalness. That's okay, this. that's my job. You know, I'll, I'll give it to you. I'll, I'll give it to you as a photograph. And I. I uh, yeah, they portray. I think portraits don't. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Marty, and thank, thank you all. You. Please go up and buy a book. <laughs>